for coming. The students locked the doors. Moments later, tear gas canisters crashed through the windows, filling the library with choking smoke. What is happening to Indian Muslims today did not happen overnight, Mr. Azam says. If we don't protest against it now, we will end up living like slaves. Mr. Modi's supporters have dismissed the protesters as being exclusively Muslim or from a die-hard political opposition group. But in Assam, many protesters said they had voted for the Bharatiya Janata, Bharatiya Janata Party and now regretted it. On Monday morning, some 5,000 protesters of many faiths gathered in central Guwahati, Assam's ca capital. One chant echoed across town, down with Modi. So there again, you see uh, a description of a place that is, is kind of closing ranks and trying to define a national identity using <clears throat> incremental steps, just little steps along the way, but very clearly headed towards a particular result. And there are a lot of people these days, even our current president, who speak of national, nationalism in positive terms and say, well, there's nothing wrong with being a nationalist. I mean, it's just uh, being proud of who you are and what you are. So it's taking the notion that a nation has, it's in a, in a very clear way, it is similar to racism in the sense that it takes this imaginary thing, race on one hand, and or national identity on the other and, and makes it into something that is more than it is. A national identity is a combination of where you live and a certain kind of cultural set of beliefs that you might have, and in many cases ethnicity as well. But it's not always all three of those things. It's often just one or the other. Um, and so this notion that because you live in a certain area, and have a certain similar set of beliefs that there's something unique about you and the people that you're with that is unique to you and to that place is pretty far-fetched if you think about it. I mean, uh, it goes back to the, the notion of uh, assimilation that, that people talk about, like uh, people come to your country and are supposedly assimilate without affecting the people that are already there. There's, this is the notion of the melting pot in America is originally started out as an interesting idea where everyone would come in, bring a little bit of their background and their identity and, and their religion and their cultures and all those things, and it would all melt together to form this new thing. But that has changed over the years, and then it has become this... Uh, belief that immigrants are supposed to come here and change who they are to be more like the people that are already there. And that's different from the melting pot. The melting pot, as an idea, as an ideal, let's say, was assimilation in, in the most, the broadest sense. It was the people who were already there and the people who were coming in new, all changing to become some new thing because of the influence and the presence of each other. Today, the idea of assimil assimilation that we hear, uh, used often in uh, discussions of immigration, is the notion that you're going to come from somewhere else with your unique identity, your, your uh, culture, your religion, your language, your tastes, your experiences, and you're going to come and you're going to turn into a, new, a newish version of all the people that are already there who will remain unchanged by you. So this idea of assimilation is really often, as it's used now, is primarily people saying, we don't want you to change us. We want you to change to suit us or you are not welcome here. This is related to and very much a part of the notion of nationalism, which, uh, as was described earlier, is this notion that because you live in an area and you share uh, one of any number of things, an ethnicity or a culture or a religion or something like that, that you are therefore part of this group that should remain distinct and separate and not be affected 
by others. And that's why nationalism all, almost always essentially goes hand in hand with anti-immigrant sentiment because it, it wants to exclude anyone who is not one of us already, basically, from coming here. The more open-minded nationalists nowadays use the term uh, assimilation a lot to state that, well, if you, you are going to come here, at least you need to learn our language, uh, adopt our religion and customs and blah, 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 and become one of us, like us. So you, you have to uh, go through this absolute change of who you are to suit this new group. So really all it boils down to is another form of bigotry or another form of exclusion, an us versus them kind of thinking. Uh, that's all that nationalism ends up being. So the last story that I wanted to read today is uh, comes from <laughs> all places, the Heritage Foundation, which is a very extremely conservative um, organization. And this is a very conservative writer, and he says some things in here that I do not agree with. But generally speaking, he makes a pretty good case about nationalism, and I thought it was worth reading. So this is from the executive vice president of the Heritage Foundation, and it is entitled The Problem of Nationalism. And it reads as follows. At first glance, the new nationalism of conservatives will seem benign and even uncontroversial. In his book, The Case for Nationalism, Rich Lowry defines nationalism as flowing from a pe people's natural devotion to their home and to their country. Yoram Hazoni, in his book, The Virtue of Nationalism, also has a rather anodyne definition. It means that the world is governed best when nations agree to cultivate their own traditions free from interference by other nations. And then he says, there is nothing particularly controversial at all about these statements. I would disagree with that, but I will continue reading. I'm not going <laughs> to break in on every uh, point that I disagree with, but I just wanted to make that point. Anyway, defined in these terms, it sounds like little more than simply defending nationality or national sovereignty, sovereignty, which is why Lowry, Hazoni, and others insist their definition of nationalism has nothing to do with the most virulent forms of involving ethnicity, race, militarism, or fascism. Here's the problem. I suppose any of us can take any tradition that has a definite history and simply redefine it to our liking. We could then give ourselves permission to castigate anyone who doesn't agree with us as misunderstanding or even libeling us. But who actually is responsible for the misunderstanding here? The people who are trying to redefine the term or the people who remind us of nationalism's real history and what nationalism actually has been in history, which raises an even bigger question. Why go down this road at all? If you have to spend half of your time explaining, oh, I didn't mean that kind of nationalism, why would you want to associate a venerable tradition of American civic patriotism, national pride, and American exceptionalism at all with the various nationalisms that have occurred in the world? After all, American conservatives have argued that one of the great things about America was that it was different from all other countries, different from all other nationalisms. Here's my point. Nationalism is not the same thing as national identity. It's not the same thing as respect for national sovereignty. It's not even the same thing as national pride. It's something historically and philosophically different. And those differences are not merely semantic, technical, or the preoccupations of academic historians. In fact, they go to the very essence of what it means to be an American. I think I understand why some people will be attracted to the concept of nationalism. President Trump used the term nationalism. National conservatives think that President Trump has tapped into a new populism for conservatism, and they want to take advantage of it. They think that traditional fusionist conservatism and the American exceptionalism idea are not strong enough. These ideas are not muscular enough. They want something stronger to stand up to the universal claims of globalism and progressivism that they believe are anti-American. They also want something stronger to push back on open borders and limitless immigration. I understand that. I understand very well the desire to have a muscular reaction to the overreach of 
overreach of international governance and globalism. And I have no trouble at all arguing that an international system based on nation states and national sovereignty is vastly superior, especially for the United States, to one that is run by a global governing body that is democratically remote from the people. So what's the problem then? Why can't we all just agree that nationalism defined in this way is what we American conservatives have been believed, have been and believed all along? That it's just a new, more fashionable bottle for a very old wine. Well, because the new bottle changes the way that the wine will be viewed. Why do we need a new bottle at all? It would be like putting in perfectly good California Cabernet in a bottle labeled from Germany or France or Russia or China. The problem lies in the little suffix ism. It indicates that the word nationalism means a general practice, system, philosophy, or ideology that is true for all. There is a tradition of nationalism out there that we Americans are part of. All countries have nationalisms. All nations and all people are distinguished by what makes them different. Their common heritage as nationalists is actually their difference. Their different languages, their different ethnicities, their different cultures. At the same time, all nations supposedly share the same sovereignty and rights of the nation state, regardless of their form of government. A sovereign democratic nation state is, in this respect, no different from a sovereign authoritarian nation state. Regardless of the different kinds of government, it's the commonality of the nation state that matters. Therefore, the sovereignty of Iran, or North Korea, is, by this way of thinking, morally and legally no different than the sovereignty of the United States or any other democratic nation. I firmly believe, not I, me, but I, the writer, firmly believes that not all, not all nation states are the same. There have been times in history when nations have been associated with racism, ethnic supremacy, militarism, communism, and fascism. Does that mean that all nation states are that way? Of course not. But there is a huge difference between the historical phenomena of nationalism and respect for the sovereignty of a democratic nation state. Nationalism celebrates cultural and even ethnic differences of a people regardless of the form of government. The democratic nation state, on the other hand, grounds its legitimacy and its sovereignty in democratic governance. The biggest problem causes causing this misunderstanding is not recognizing the actual history of nationalism. It is, as I mentioned before, to confuse national identity, national consciousness, and national sovereignty with nationalism with a capital N. He's saying the word nationalism a lot here. It's kind of hard after a while. Nationalism, as we historically know it, arose not in America but in Europe. Our independence movement was a revolt of the people over the type of government that we had under the British. The founders at first thought of themselves as Englishmen, who were being denied their rights by Parliament and by the Crown. Yes, Americans certainly had an identity, but it was not based on ethnicity, language, or even religion alone. It had already developed a very distinct understanding of self-government, and that was the key to the revolution. By this time, Americans already had a fairly strong sense of identity, but that identity was not nationalism. Why is that? Because nationalism had not been invented yet. It didn't exist at the time of the American Revolution. This harkens back to our first story. Modern nationalism began in France in the French Revolution. The revolution was a call to the arms of the French people. The French nation was born in the French Revolution. The terror and Napoleonic imperialism were the highest expression of this newborn French nationalism. Napoleon's nationalist imperialism, in turn, sparked the rise of counter-reactionary nationalism in Germany and all over Europe. Germans, Russians, Austrians, and other nations discovered their own national consciousness and the importance of their own cultures in their hatred of the French invaders. After that, nationalism raged across the 19th and 20th centuries as a celebration of nations based on the common national culture and a common language and a common historical experience. Nationalism was, in this sense, particularistic. It was populistic. It was exclusive. It was zero-sum. It celebrated differences, not the common humanity of Christianity as it had been known in the Holy Roman Empire or the Catholic Church or even the Enlightenment. 
The key to nationalism was the nation-state. Technically, it wasn't the people themselves who were free or sovereign as the people, but the people represented by and in the name of the nation-state. In other words, their governments. Sovereignty ultimately resided in the state, not the people. The state was above the people, not of, by, and for the people, as in the American experience. To this day, this idea lives in the British monarchy, for example, where the queen is the ultimate sovereign, not the people or the parliament. It is unfortunately a common historical error to equate nationalism with the historic rise of the nation-state in Europe and the international state system that arose after the Peace of Westphalia in 1648. The Westphalian peace did not did recognize the sovereignty of princes over and against the universal claims of the Holy Roman Empire and the Church, and it's true that the Protestant Protestant Reformation did solidify the sovereignty of the princes and the principalities as forerunners to the nation-state. But these were princes. These were monarchies. They were dynasties. It wasn't until much later that the modern nation-state and especially the popular sentiments of nationalism arose in history. Whatever the state system was, it is not nationalism. Nationalism is a historic phenomena that did not emerge for another 150 years after 1648. Claiming otherwise is just bad history, pure and simple. That bring me, brings me to the idea of American exceptionalism, which is, I believe, the answer to the question of America's national identity and what it should be. It's a beautiful concept that captures both the reality and the ambiguity of the American experience. It's based on a universal creed, it is grounded in America's founding principles, natural law, liberty, limited government, individual rights, the checks and balances of government, popular sovereignty, not the sovereignty of the folkish nation-state, the civilizing role of religion in civil society, and not an established religion associated with one class or creed, and the crucial role of civil society and civil institutions in grounding and mediating our democracy and our freedom. We as Americans believe these principles are right and true for all people, and not just for us. That was the way that Washington and Jefferson understood them, and it was certainly the way that Lincoln understood them. That's what makes them universal. In other words, the American creed grounds us in universal principles. But what, you may ask, makes us so exceptional then? If it's universal, what makes us exceptional? It is, in fact, the creed. We believe that Americans are different because our creed is both universal and exceptional at the same time. We are exceptional in the unique way we apply our universal principles. I'm not sure I'm totally following him here, but let's go down, let's follow him along and see what he has to say. It doesn't necessarily mean that we are better than other peoples, though I think probably most Americans do believe that they are. I would say that's true of a lot of people. It's not really about bragging rights. Rather, it's a statement of historical fact that there is something truly different and unique about the United States, which becomes lost when talking in terms of nationalism. A nationalist cannot say this because there is nothing universal about nationalism except that all nationalisms are, well, different and particularistic. Nationalism is devoid of a common idea or principle of government except that a people or a nation-state can be almost anything. It can be fascist, it can be authoritarian, it can be totalitarian, or it can be democratic. Some of the new nationalists doubt explicitly the importance of the American creed. They argue that the creed is not as important as we thought it was to our national identity. Let's just think about that for a minute. What does it mean to say that the creed... Oops, I lost my spot. What? Hold on, hold on. Oh, gosh, I went the wrong way. Sorry. I am human. I have feelings. Okay, let's think about this for a minute. What does it mean to say that the creed really isn't all that important? If the creed doesn't matter, what is so special about America? Is it our language? Well, no. We share that with Britain and now much of the world. Is it our ethnicity? Well, that doesn't work either because there's no such thing as a common American ethnicity. Is it a specific religion? We are indeed a religious country, but no, we have freedom of religion, not one specific religion. Is it our beautiful rivers and mountains? No, we've got some beautiful rivers and mountains, but so do other countries. 
Yes, indeed. Is it our culture? Yes, I suppose so, but how do you understand American culture without the American creed and the founding principles? Lincoln called America the world's last best hope because it was a place where all people can and should be free. Because before Lincoln, Jefferson called it an empire of liberty. Immigrants came here and became true Americans by living the American creed and the American dream. You can become a French citizen, but for most Frenchmen, if you are foreign, that is not the same thing as being French. It's different here. You can be a real American by adopting our creed and our way of life. Okay, this gets into the assimilation thing, and we won't go there right now because we've already talked about it. But I thought I'd bring it up because I made a point of talking about it before I got into this because I knew he was going to get to that. Anyway, after World War II, the American way and our devotion to democracy became a beacon of freedom for the whole world. That was the foundation of our claim to world leadership in the Cold War, and it is no different today. If we become a nation, just like any other nation, then frankly I would, would not expect any other nation to grant us, grant us any special trust or support. Another benefit of American exceptionalism is that it is self-correcting. When we fail to live up to our ide ideals, as we did with slavery before the Civil War, we can appeal, as Lincoln did, to our better nature to correct our flaws. That is where the central importance of the creed comes in. Applying the principles of the De Declaration of Independence correctly has allowed us to redeem ourselves and our history when we have gone astray. There is no American identity without the American creed. However, the nationalists are correct about one thing in suggesting that the American identity is more than just about a set of ideas. These ideas are lived in our culture. That is true. It is also true, as Lincoln said about the famous mystic chords of memory, that our common experience and our common history form a unique story. It is a story that embodies the very real lives and relationships of people and a shared cultural experience in a shared space and time in history that we call the United States. The sharing of experience in space and time in and of itself is not unlike what any other nation experiences. At the most basic level, yes, I would say that all nations are in that respect alike. But what made it different for Lincoln was that he believed and he hoped that the better angels of our nature that was grounded in the American creed would touch the mystic chords of memory that make up that story, and it was that touch that set us apart from other nations. Hmm. Well, who knows? Let me end by making two points. One, the degree to which national conservatism sounds plausible rests on a profound historical misunderstanding. Statements in and of themselves that sound true and even attractive have to be superseded in a state of historical amnesia. Oh, excuse me. Let me try that again. Statements in and of themselves that sound true and even attractive have to be suspended in a state of historical amnesia to make sense. I was talking about that earlier, too. When Hazani says, national cohesion is the secret ingredient that allows free institutions to exist, it makes an almost obvious banal point, at least for the countries that are already free. The problem begins when he associates this with the general tradition of the virtues of nationalism as a concept. Then it gets really messy. Is national cohesion the secret ingredient to free institutions, to nationalists in Russia? In China or in Iran? Hardly. In fact, nationalism in these countries is the bitter enemy of free institutions. If the answer is, well, I don't mean that kind of nationalism, then the question gets really begged. Why make broad general statements about nationalism at all if the exceptions loom so large, if in fact the exceptions end up being the rule? My second point is this. If this were just an academic debate over the idea of nationalism, then I suppose it really wouldn't be all that important. You could let the intellectuals split their hairs and historians make their points in the his about the history of nationalism, and you could go and see whether or not the concept of nationalism really helps us politically, whether it's true or not. I fear the problem is bigger than that for conservatives. The conservative movement today faces huge threats to our most basic principles. From the left, we face progressives who have always said that our creed and our claims to American exceptionalism were a fraud. This is not true. Exactly. 
They have always argued that we were a nation like any other. In fact, the more radical of them argue that we are actually worse than other nations precisely because our founding principles were supposedly based on lies. Well, this is, in fact, kind of true. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry. I'm not here to argue with this guy. I'm just reading. Okay, now we face a new challenge on the sanctity of the American creed from a different direction, this time from the right. It comes first from blurring the distinctions between nationalism, as always practiced, and the uniqueness of American exceptionalism. Then it goes on to raise the specter of the nation-state as being an idea, if not the central idea, to American conservatism. That's no different from what a continental European conservative probably would say about their traditions. Frankly, I don't get this at all. American conservatives are skeptical of the government. They're skeptical of the nation-state. That's what makes us conservative. So why elevate the concept of the nation-state that is so foreign to the American conservative tradition? I fear the answer may have to do with the deeper philosophical transformation that is going on inside some conservative political circles. It is now becoming fashionable for some conservatives to criticize capitalism and the free market. Some are even arguing that there are now no limiting principles to what the state and the government can or should do in the name of their political agenda. This used to be called big government conservatism. It, is, it was seen then as a liberal proposition, and it still is in my view. It shares a troubling principle with modern progressivism. Deep down, having the government rather than the people make important decisions about their lives is, in principle, no different than a progressive arguing for the need for government to end poverty and eliminate inequality. Apparently, the idea is that, with conservatives in charge of government, this time it will be different. This time we will make sure that the government that we control will drive investments in the right direction, and we will make the right decisions on what the trade-offs are. Does this sound familiar? Don't defenders of big government always argue that this time it will be different? Put aside for a moment whether we conservatives would ever control such a government to sufficiently do the things we want it to do. Do we want to empower a government even more in industrial and other kinds of economic and social policy that will surely use the very increased power to destroy the things that we love and believe about this country? The best way, in my opinion, to protect America's greatness is its special claims, its identity, if you will, is to believe that what made us great in the first place, believe in what made us great in the first place. It wasn't our language. It wasn't our race. It wasn't our ethnicity. It wasn't our industrial policy. It was the power of governments to decide what the trade-offs are. It wasn't in a government that decides what kind of work is dignified and what kind of work is not. It certainly wasn't a belief in the nation-state or the greatness of nationalism. It was our creed and the belief system that was personified and lived in a culture, our institutions of civil societies, and our democratic way of government that made America the greatest nation in the history of all nations. In a word, it was our belief in ourselves as a good and free people. That's what made America exceptional. That's what made us a free country, and it continues to do so today. So, I, like I said, I don't agree with everything this guy said. Some of that was hard to read, but... Uh, this basic point about nationalism, I think, is pretty right on the money, as as, it, um, as I stated earlier. And I made all my arguments. I've run out of time, so uh, my arguments are done. Uh, I'll just leave you with that. It, uh, it was kind of interesting, I think, to read a, a uh, an anti-nationalist uh, statement from a conservative point of view rather than my usual progressive, liberal, or whatever you want to call it, point of view. Anyway, you have been listening to CU Immigration here on WRFULP Urbana 104.5 FM and UPTV and or YouTube and or whatever way you get it. And I hope that you will tune in again sometime, maybe next time. And until then, we'll see you later. Bye-bye. <laughs>